So in our series entitled One Week to Live, we're going day by day through the last week of Jesus' life. Today we come to Friday, and I'll give you a little preview. Next week we're actually doubling up on Friday because there's so much that happens there. And today we're going to turn our attention to failure Friday because a centerpiece of what happens on that day is the reality of the brokenness and the failure that can take place in the human heart. And what do we do in those moments? And my guess is there doesn't need to be a lot of convincing that that can be the reality for us. And so beyond just recognizing that failures happen, how do we move forward? How do we make a comeback? How do we move beyond the failures that we experience? Let me begin um, by just sharing this with you. And I don't know about you, I like stories of people who have failed but then make a comeback where they had a difficult time and then they succeed. Uh, here's one example. This man lost a job, lost eight elections. This guy couldn't be elected dog catcher um, for a while. Failed in business, had a nervous breakdown, lost five more elections after that. Many people consider him to go on to become maybe the greatest president we've ever had. His name is Abraham Lincoln. Um, somebody more recently, and this is a lady who was unemployed, she was a single mom, struggled with depression, contemplated suicide, she was on welfare to survive, and in a statement to a Harvard business gathering, she said, I was the biggest failure I knew. And she went on to write the most successful children's literature of all time, the Harry Potter series, her name is J.K. Rowling. There's something about people who have experienced failure and make a recovery from that that I think we understand has molded them and shaped them in meaningful, important, and positive ways. Well, here's what we're gonna do today is we're gonna track somebody who experienced a moral failure, a spiritual shipwreck, and then somebody who personally betrayed their friend. And we're gonna journey with somebody named Peter. And if you know anything about Peter as one of the followers of Jesus, he was pretty outspoken. He was the bold one. You know, and he often gets criticized. There's one day Jesus is walking on water because he's God in the flesh, and he calls out Peter out of the boat, and we kind of criticize him because he began to sink, and Jesus rescues him. But to his credit, he's the only guy that got out of the boat. Everybody else stayed safe inside of the boat. And so Peter, you know, had remarkable faith at times, but then he also had a remarkable ability to insert foot into mouth and maybe say more than his heart could deliver on. And we're going to see him walk through this, but we're also going to see him make a comeback from it. And so today, we're really going to talk about a couple things. Why do we fail? What are some of the common reasons that people like us fail, people like Peter? And then also, we're going to look at how to make a comeback. Now, as we begin, and we begin with the three common reasons that we fail, I want to shape something up front for you because you might say, well, where is Peter's account of this story? And we're going to be in the gospel that's called Mark. There are four gospel accounts, the life and times of Jesus, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And commentators are virtually unanimous that the gospel of Mark is actually Peter's story, that he said it to somebody who wrote it down whose name was Mark, but it is his firsthand account of walking together 
with Jesus. And we're going to look at an experience that's recorded there that shows him in the worst light possible. And we may ask the question, Peter, why would you, you know, include this story where you don't look so good? And if you look at the context of when this was written, and then we have documents that even go back to the first century. So people who tell you the Bible was written way later, no, we have copies that go right back to like 30 years after Jesus was on this earth. And there was an emperor in the Roman Empire at that time. His name was Nero. And if you know anything about Nero, he was not a good guy. And Nero, at one point, is the first emperor to launch persecution against followers of Jesus. You're not going to call me as the Caesar Lord? Well, then you're going to be fed to the lions. And they would round people up, bring them into the arena, and they were told, you have a choice right now. You don't have to face the lions. You just go over and grab some of that incense and you throw it into that fire and you renounce Jesus and you declare Caesar as Lord and you can walk out of here. And that's exactly what some people did. And then there were other people who stayed true to their commitment and they said, no, I can't say that. Only Jesus is Lord. And they faced the lions and they lost their lives as a result of that. And there's a lot of ideas and memories from those early days Because imagine this, imagine we're gathering as a church right now, but all of a sudden there's a knock at the door and that whole lion in the arena has played out. And standing there wanting to come in are some people who took some of that incense, threw it in the fire and renounced Jesus. Can they come in? And so many people believe that why Peter includes this story is to really shape the kind of community that even we're a part of today. What does it mean for people to experience personal failure in this world. How do we deal with that on the other side of it? So let's look at three common reasons we fail. This is right from Peter's story. Here's the first one. I overestimate my strength. That there is a confidence that I have about myself that I ultimately cannot deliver on. And Jesus said to them, now where we left off last week was in the Passover meal. Jesus gathered in an upper room with his disciples and they're having this meal. Judas, the traitor, has gotten up and walked out and Jesus indicated that one of them was going to hand him over. And then all the rest of them think, well, you know, we're not sure who it is, but then Judas gets up and walks out. Then Jesus said to them, you will all fall away. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee, right? So Jesus knows what's going to happen ahead of time. And all of you are going to abandon me. But after I'm raised up, I'll go before you in Galilee. Peter said to him, even though they all fall away, I will not. And boy, isn't there a lot to admire in those words. Jesus, I'm committed. I'm all in. I will go to the end, even if it's hard, even if it means my very life. I am with you. And then Jesus has some personal words for Peter. Jesus said to him now, not to all of them, to him. Him is Peter. Truly, I tell you this very night before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. But he said emphatically, right? Sometimes we don't know what was the tone of what was said in the Bible. Emphatically. If I must die with you, I will not deny you. And they all said the same. Big talking, big promise, Peter. And there are times, you know, his faith was remarkable. But on this moment, he's got a confidence in himself that ultimately his character will not be able to deliver. And I wonder if sometimes in our own journey, when we look for confidence, we look to ourselves. And we think that it's up to us, and if I make a full and final commitment, that's where my strength lies. But there is a reality about the human heart that we need to acknowledge here, that we need to proceed with humility and with some recognition that this heart of mine is capable of some things that under the right circumstances are doable for me. And there's an old saying, there but for the grace of God go I. There's a lot of reality to that. But so often we can conclude, yeah, I know that's out there and I know some people deal with that. I will never struggle with that. 
You know, maybe somebody says something like this, you know, there's just a lot of racial tension in this world right now, and I fear that it could even be a part of life in the church and following after God. And I think that's a moment and an opportunity for, take, for us to take some introspection and, and see the possibility even of that. But wouldn't it be easy to say, yeah, well, I can understand how everybody else would do that. And in this moment, you know what Peter's saying? All these other losers that you called Jesus may abandon you, but I won't. I'll be true to the end. We can be that guy in that moment. When we say, yeah, maybe everybody else does that, not me. I'm all in. Maybe we look at some of the materialism today and we say, yeah, it seems more about stuff, about toys, than it seems about what it's really about. We prize, you know, things over people and we prize status maybe over God and our identity with God. Yeah, well, I understand how everybody else, you know, can fall to that, but not this guy. I'm good. I'm all in. I'll never do that. We need to have a measure of humility in these hearts of ours to know our hearts to the degree that we recognize that under the right circumstances, there before the grace of God go I. Think about some other arenas in which if somebody said something to us, would we ever make those kind of bold claims? That's a weird analogy, but I'm going to use it anyway. I have an amazing assistant here. We've worked together for a long time. Her name is Michelle. Michelle is hardworking. She's diligent. She's really good at what she does. She's also honest. Some might say blunt. I will say honest. And there have been times, you know, when I've come in and she's looked at me. It's happened probably a couple times. And she'll go, um... You got a thing hanging out of your nose there? It's like, could you imagine saying, I understand that everybody else can have a thing hanging out of their nose, but I will never have a thing hanging out of my nose. No, those are the moments you go, oh, thank you, and you get a tissue, right? I wonder if we can have that same kind of openness with these hearts of ours to recognize the strength ultimately is not in ourselves. And Peter is going to discover that the hard way because his mouth made a promise that his character could not keep. And there's something in the human heart that we've got to recognize, try as hard as we might, we just cannot seem to rein it all in. So we can overestimate our strength. Secondly, I can fear disapproval. That I care more about the opinions of others than I care about the opinion of God. And that's part of Peter's story as well. Check this out. And as, whoop, I think we jumped ahead. Let's back up one. And as Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came and seeing Peter warming himself, she looked at him and said, you also were with the Nazarene Jesus. Now, in the first part of that verse, notice how Peter is close in proximity to Jesus. And every indication is that they can see each other and he has now been brought in. He's been arrested. They left the Passover meal. They went to the Garden of Gethsemane. That's where Judas brought the religious leaders and some guards to arrest Jesus. He's now been taken to where the official court is, and they've begun to try him, to question him, and Peter can see him. And then this happens. A girl, and the indication is she's probably a young teenager. She would be in our fifth and sixth grade group right now. And she says to Peter, hey, you were with him, weren't you? But he denied it. I'll be with you to the very end, Jesus. I'll die for you if I have to. But he denied it. Saying, I neither know nor understand what you mean. And he went out into the gateway and the rooster crowed and the servant girl saw him and began again to say to the bystanders, this man is one of them. And so now she is gathering some others around and you can kind of picture this scene. And now Peter has not just a young girl, but also a group of people who are all saying, hey, aren't you one of his followers? And then what does he do? But again, he denied it. The man who said he was all in. The one who said, I'll stick with you, Jesus, even if it costs me everything. I'll stick with you. So let me ask you this question. Whose opinion matters more than God's? And there can be a lot of different pressures and a lot of different ideas. And it can be real easy 
to value the opinions of others more than it is to value the opinion of God and to stay true to our commitment to him where he has been true to us. And the rooster is going to crow again. And remember, they are in eyesight of each other. And there's actually one of the Gospels that tells us there's a moment in which they locked eyes with each other. And I wonder what it was that Peter felt and thought about in that moment. Oh, yeah. Just minutes ago, maybe hours, I said I would die with him. And now I just lied about him and blew him off. Another way that we fail is I speak from insecurity and exhaustion. Here's how it plays out in Peter's story. And after a little while, the bystanders again said to Peter, certainly you are one of them for you're a Galilean. And just like we have in our nation, right, if somebody showed up from New York and talked with a New York accident or somebody from the deep south, you would know they're not from these parts here in Utah. And there they have different dialects and different accents as well. And just by the way he was speaking, he began to invoke a curse on himself and to swear, I do not know this man of whom you speak. Now there's a couple interesting words in there, right? There's a curse and there's a swear. Now, swear is our word like a vow or taking an oath, right? Do you solemnly swear to tell the whole truth, nothing but the truth, so help you God? So this is a vow, what he spoke. But there's also the word curse. Now, if you know Peter's background, he was a fisherman. And maybe you think, well, fisherman vocabulary would lend itself in that direction. You know, maybe he's just using some bad words there. It's worse than that. The word curse actually comes from a root word from which we get our word anathematize. And if you know what that means, that means basically to condemn someone to the hot place. And so what Peter said on that day, and I'm not going to use what I think were the exact words because I've made a commitment that I'm not going to use some words that I used previously in another part of my life before Jesus, but I think you'll figure it out even though I clean it up a little bit. That what he's saying on this day is, hey, weren't you with him? He says, darn him to Hades. Or he's saying, you can darn me to Hades. I don't know the guy. Either way, it's rough. And a moment of darkness in a human heart of somebody who had just made a bold, over-the-top promise. A moment of betrayal to the one who rescued him from drowning. The one who we're told somewhere else in the New Testament healed his mother-in-law. The one whom he'd heard speak and perform all kinds of miracles. And at this moment, Peter wants to have nothing to do with him. How do you recover from that? How do you bounce back from failure that is so stark? Immediately, the rooster crowed a second time. And in that moment, Peter remembers his words of what Jesus knew and had just played out that Peter was blind to, as people often are. Ah, the strength is right here. I got this. Not so much. How do you make a comeback? Let's talk about that because that is part of Peter's story. And I'll give you a little bit of a preview and not about Peter. First step back is to personally own it. Because in that moment when the rooster crowed a second time, Peter remembered how Jesus had said to him, before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. And then what happens? And he broke down and wept. This is somebody at the moment that we refer to kind of in our context and especially in a recovery context, they have just hit bottom, right? How easy is it in a day like this where when something happens and all of a sudden, you know, it feels like it's about us, the desire so often today is just to feel good and to fix it immediately and just make a quick change in another direction. 
Or we live at a time where nothing is our fault anymore. And so it's so easy to point the finger at somebody else or the circumstances, you know, that just, well, it wouldn't have been the reality if that hadn't happened or she hadn't have done that or he hadn't have done that. But in this moment, somebody owns it. And he's not breaking down and weeping because he has been caught. And sometimes I get that that can happen. This is somebody recognizing his own failure, and owning it. And there's a point at which when we fail, the temptation is, man, let's just move past that really fast. Let's just cover that over. Let's make it about somebody else, not me. In this moment, Peter owns it. Maybe one way to put it is to get past failure, you have to go through it. And that there's a place where remorse is a great beginning point. It can't be the only point, but it's a great beginning point where we take personal responsibility. I've sat in a lot of counseling situations and oftentimes with couples who are in a difficult place. It looks a lot like this, where the fingers are pointing at the other person. Well, if she didn't do that, if he didn't say that, and many times there's even this generalization that can happen there. Well, I've made plenty of mistakes, but this is what she did. I said, oh, you've made plenty of mistakes? Yeah, I've made plenty of mistakes, right? And we hear that a lot. And then inevitably, I'll ask this question. So you've made plenty of mistakes. Yes, I've made plenty of mistakes. Can you name three of them specifically for me? Right, it's one thing to talk in generalities that we can all own. What is it that you would personally own in this situation? And rather than pointing the finger, what can you point to yourself about? And then often people don't come back to see me again for counseling. Um, so first, you've got to personally own it. Second is to personally connect with others. Personally connect with others. Many times when we fail, what we do is we isolate ourselves and we shut it down and the circle gets real small. And I will disconnect and separate myself from everybody who is around me. Peter doesn't do that. And this is a good direction for us. Because on Easter Sunday, just a couple days later, Jesus rises from the dead. And I'm sorry if I just gave you a spoiler alert for Easter Sunday. Jesus makes it, and it's really good news. And so when he appears to the first person, her name is Martha, in the cemetery, he lets her know that she's alive. What does she do? She went and told those who had been with him, because they're locked in a room, gathered together, and at that point, they thought it's all over. We thought it was going there. That's not how it ended. And she comes and says, it hasn't ended. But they are gathered together. And I wonder, even as they were weeping and mourning, notice how they did it together. This is the genius of something like a group called Grief Share. Well, yeah, there's grief in this world, but you know what? Don't go through it alone. Go through it together. There is a profound power in walking through that shared experience. No two experiences are the same, but there is power in journeying that together. It's the genius of Celebrate Recovery, where broken people come together, all kinds of different failures or struggles, um, brokenness, but don't go through it alone. Go through it together. It's a genius, really, of small groups. And no matter what you face, that you do not face it alone. And that you go through gathered, not alone. And even in their mourning and weeping, they did it together. So don't isolate. Gather together with others. And then third, personally receive grace. Because that's what happens to Peter. The picture is that after Jesus is crucified and all these events play out, you know where the disciples are, at least the ones that came out of the fishing business? They're back out on a boat fishing. And every indication is they went back to what they knew before because as far as they were concerned, this whole thing had come to nothing. And might as well pick it up where we left it off three years ago when we left fishing to follow Jesus but now it didn't end up the way that we thought, so let's go back to what we did before. And there's this amazing little detail in Mark's gospel as Peter shares it. 
And then Mark writes it down. Look at this little detail. But go and tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. Jesus is alive and well. He'll meet you in Galilee. Tell the followers and Peter. Why would he single him out? I think we know. There you will see him, just as he told you. And then there's this incredible picture because the disciples are out on a boat back to their fishing business and it tells us that Jesus shows up and he's on the shore and he is cooking breakfast for his friends who all scattered, who all left him. It tells us in one of the Gospels, Peter jumps out and swims to shore. And the rest of them, they told to put the net down the other side. They catch more fish than they ever have. And they come to shore and there is this reunion of those who scattered when Jesus needed them the most. And Peter is a little bit reluctant and Jesus pulls him aside. And what would he say in that moment? The one who made the bold claim, the one who said, I am Peter and I am stronger than all these other guys that you called. And that's not what happened. Jesus didn't say, how dare you? He didn't say, what were you thinking? He didn't say, you better not do that again. He actually asked him a question. He asked the same question three times. He said, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? And each time Peter responds, yes. Yes, Lord, I love you. And he reinstates Peter. Who does that? Just days after a colossal failure, Jesus reinstates Peter. You fast forward 50 days, and this thing that we're a part of right now called the church begins on a day that was called Pentecost. And people are gathered together in Jerusalem, huge amount of people there. And the church begins when somebody stands up and says, this is who Jesus is. He was predicted, he came, he lived, he died, he rose again. And 3,000 people put their hope and their trust in Jesus. You know who delivered that message? Peter, the guy who felt. Peter goes on to become the leader of the early church, and he leads well. He leads effectively. And then one day he is arrested and he's put on trial for his faith in Jesus. And they want him to recant, to say, I disown Jesus, and he would not. And they find him guilty and they are going to crucify him just like they crucified Jesus. And you know what he told them? I don't even consider myself worthy to be crucified the same way Jesus was. So crucify me upside down. And he was. What transforms somebody from looking to themselves for strength to become a strong person? It's not marshalling up more strength. It is leaning into and receiving the grace that comes from God. He owned it. He didn't walk through it alone. And ultimately, he received the grace of God. It changed the direction of his life. If you have experienced failure and you wonder, where does that leave me? Where does that put me? Has that pretty much taken me out of the game? I hope that you can hear the words that Jesus spoke on that shore of that lake that day. Do you love me? Then get back in the game. Peter, feed my sheep. Would you bow your heads together with me? 
And as you think about your own journey, your own life, maybe there are things that you know about you that you wish you could go back and undo, but here we are. We can't. And if you struggle with that, with failure, hear these words. And whatever you're envisioning in your own heart and mind, do you love me? Jesus asking you to receive grace, to lean into grace, and to pursue grace. Don't let failure keep you stuck in, past, in the past. Pursue God's vision for your future. With him, there is something to do. And Jesus' blessing is even greater than our cursing. Lord Jesus, thank you for grace upon grace. So undeserved, every bit of it, but that's what it means. And God, may we not treat that lightly, may we not take it for granted, but may we also lean hard into it, into this world filled with brokenness and broken people, including us. May we find our strength in you May we find our strength and surrender to the grace of God. Help us to see your vision for our lives together with you. Lead us in that direction, God, we ask for your name's sake alone. And so we ask and pray in Jesus' name, amen.